Verse 1.21 And remember when Prophet وسلم, left your family in the morning to post the believers at their stations for the battle of Uhud and Allah is hearing and knowing. Now, from here onwards is the discussion of the events of Battle of Uhud. So before going through the verses, I will narrate the events of the battle briefly so that knowing the events, it will be easier to understand the message of the verses. Now, after the first year when Muslims had emigrated from Mecca to Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to start with allowed the Muslims to make battle or to do qital or jihad. The second year, Muslims were ordered to make qital, as in Surah Baqarah, Allah ordered, Qutiba alaykum al wa huwa lakum. And also the charter of fighting was explained in detail, as we already read through in the Surah Baqarah. Now, after these two orders, in the second year, the Ramzan of second year, there was the Battle of Badr, where 300 mujahideen from Medina, they were to face an army of 1,000 soldiers of Quraysh led by Abu Jahl. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped. And uh, the Muslims, they had a remarkable victory. And the arrogant Meccan army had to face a terrible defeat. Now, to take the revenge and also to teach the Muslims a lesson for the future, and um, the army, the people of Quraysh and people of Mecca, they decided to attack the Muslims next year. Abu Jahl had died in the Battle of Badr, uh, in the Battle of Badr, and Abu Sufyan was now leading the Quraysh. Now it was uh, decided and it was announced that all the income which they will be getting from the usury or, intra or interest for the next year, it will be collected for the purpose of battle against the Muslims. And the Quraysh, they also succeeded to motivate the other tribes around Mecca to uh, help them. And uh, finally, they succeeded in gathering an army of 3,000 soldiers. Hazrat Abbas, ta'ala, and who, who was the paternal uncle of Prophet Wasallam, after Badr, he had been greatly touched by the kindness of Prophet Wasallam, and so he had accepted Islam. But he had not revealed his Islam, he had kept it secret and it was concealed. He managed to inform Prophet Wasallam about the intentions of the Meccans and their preparations to advance towards Medina for an attack. As for the order of Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered uh, counseling, wa'mur shura bainahum, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa gathered his companions and uh, for consultation and whether they should fight remaining and staying in Mecca, in Medina, or they should advance to, uh, to face the Meccan army. The courageous and the sincere companions, they, their suggestions were that they should leave Medina and they should advance to fight the Meccans like brave people. And the hypocrites, how were they opposed? And they suggested that they should stay in Medina and wait for the army of Mecca to come. <coughs> Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and who, who was the uncle of Prophet sallallahu he insisted on advancing for battle and he took an oath that he will not eat or drink till he goes out of Medina and he fights the enemy advancing from their own city. Now Prophet sallallahu according to the suggestions, he gave orders for the preparation of an army of Mujahideen and so finally an army of 1,000 Mujahideen left Medina towards the towards Ohad. Halfway through the leader of hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, he said that uh, he took away 250 of his companions and they came back to Medina. And they were saying that they were not, their suggestions were not accepted and they had not been heard. So they will not, they will not uh, support the Muslims also. 
Now the Muslim army reached Uhud before the Meccan army and the ground of Uhud, this is sort of a valley and it is encircled by high mountains. And these mountains are of hard black igneous rocks, which were made thousands of years before by volcanic eruptions. And so around this, this ground of Uhud, <coughs> there are mountains on all the sides. And so Prophet Sallallahu arriving there, he appointed the army chiefs in the battlefield. They were deputed, uh, they were put, they were advised to stay in their specific positions. Hazrat Hamza, radiallahu ta'ala, and who he was appointed in the center of the army, Hazrat Ali on the right side, and Hazrat Migdad bin Aswad on the right, on the left wing. And then Prophet Sallallahu also took notice of the mountain pass, which was between the mountains at the back of the army. Between the two mountains, there was a path through which the army could have attacked the Muslims also. So Prophet Sallallahu he appointed a group of 30 archers under the leadership of Hazrat Abdullah bin Jubair. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu gave them very strict instructions and he addressed them and told them that the security and the guarding of the back of the army of Muslims is your duty. And if you do not leave the position, then we will stay safe. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu very strictly ordered them that you do not leave the position of this mountain pass, even if you see that our flesh and bones are being cut off. And he clearly instructed them that do not leave your post until and unless you receive an order from the battlefield. And then Prophet Sallallahu said that, oh Allah, be a witness. Now, when the battle started, the companions, uh, they fought courageously, laying down their lives one after the other. There was uh, the martyr of Uhud was Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was martyred by a Negro slave, Wahshi because uh, Hind had promised to free him, to set him free if he had killed Hazrat uh, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And uh, when Hind, she got the news that, uh, Prophet, uh, that Hazrat Hamza had been killed by Washi and Washi had succeeded, she walked to the battlefield and she cut open, she cut open Hazrat Hamza's chest and abdomen and she took out his liver and she was chewing it and she was spitting it in revenge. How crude, how crude, how hard-hearted and how inhuman these people were. And you will see that the teachings and the preaching and the invitations and the behavior of Prophet was which converted them towards Islam also. Hazrat Musa bin Umair, a companion of Prophet he was the flag bearer in the battle of Uhud. And um, his, he was holding the flag of the Muslim army in his right hand. And his right hand was cut and he shifted the flag to the left hand. And then his left hand was also cut. And then he was holding the flag with the, both the stumps of the arms. And uh, he was then martyred. And uh, then there was the martyrdom of Hazrat Hamza, Hazrat Hanzala, who his wife explains that he had been married the day the army left Medina. The, the army left for Medina for Uhud. He was married the same day. And he was with his new bride when he heard the announcement of the departure of the army. And he left in urgency and he even forgot to take the bath of purity. And when he entered the battlefield, there he was fighting and he was martyred. And Prophet Sallallahu informed the companions that I have been told that Hanzala was given a bath by the angels with the water from a fountain of Jannah, that is with the water of the Sneem. And when companions they saw, they saw that droplets were trickling down the hair of the dead body of Hazrat Hanzala radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And now, because of all these brave sacrifices and all this, the brave manner and the courageous manner, the sincere companions, they were fighting, they had obeyed. They had obeyed Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They had 
they had fought patiently and they had relied on the promises of Allah. So the help of Allah came. The rule of Allah, in Allah ma'aswabirin, it operated, and the help of Allah joined the Muslim army. And the Muslim army of 750, they came out victorious. They came out victorious as compared to the Meccan army of 3,000. This was with what? This was nasrum min Allah, the help of Allah. Now the companions themselves, they they have reported that they saw the enemy flee. And they also, they've also mentioned that they saw that the ladies of Quraysh, they also, they were running away in terror, raising their gowns to expose their legs. So this proved what? That initially the Muslims, they came out victorious with the help of Allah. And after this, the Muslim warriors, the Mujahideen, they started collecting their booty. Now this is where the issue arose. And this is where the issue arose and it caused the reversal of the whole scenario. The archers who had been strictly instructed by Prophet وسلم, not to leave the mountain pass and to guard the mountain pass at the back. They, they saw that the Mujahideen, the soldiers, they were collecting the booty. Now, what happened was that the most disliked feeling, which feeling? The love of the world, the love of the worldly riches and the lust and the desire of the money. As Allah explains in Quran, innahu lahubbil khayri la shadeed, that the only problem, the only issue which distracts you, which diverts you, which deviates you is what? Is the love of money. And Allah says in Quran, jama. You are madly in love with the wealthy riches, with the worldly riches and with all the wealth of this world. So these feelings, they overpowered them. And they developed the feeling that the booty will be all gathered and it will be taken up by the Mujahideen and they will be deprived. And you know what? Some of them, they also developed a thought and a feeling that even Prophet ﷺ might be unjust and he might be unfair and deprive them of the shares of uh, booty of the war. So when such feelings developed, they left their duty, they disobeyed Prophet Sallallahu instructions, and they also came in the battlefield and they started collecting the booty themselves. Hazrat uh, Abdullah bin Jubair, he was continuously calling them from behind and reminding them of uh, Prophet Sallallahu instructions, but they did not respond and they did not even obey their leader. So disobedience on top of disobedience, they continued out of sheer love of the wealth of this world. Now this disobedience of Prophet Sallallahu and disregarding the orders of their leaders because of what? Because of the love of money, this was disliked by Allah. And this led to the reversal of the situations. Now, how did the reversal take place was that while the Meccan army was going back, Hazrat Khalid bin Walid, who till then was still a non-believer, and he was in the army of the enemy. He caught sight of the pass behind the Muslim army that it was no longer guarded and protected. So he immediately stopped. <coughs> we, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with excellent, he had excellent God-gifted military skills. So till now, all these military skills, they were being used for the, for not for the Muslim army, but they were you, being used for the Muslim enemies. Now he stopped there and he told Abu Sufyan that they should attack again. And he told him that he will go all around the mountain to attack the unaware, unaware Muslim enemy from their back through the unguarded uh, mountain pass. And he asked Abu Sufyan to attack the Muslim army from the front. So what they planned was that they would like sandwich the Muslim army between the two armies, uh, the two Quraysh armies attacking from the front and from the back. <coughs> the Muslims, they all the Mujahideen, they were busy collecting the booty and the attack was like totally unexpected. They were taken unaware. And so what happened was that the Muslims, they started running away from the battlefield, leaving Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam alone. 
And this happened because of many factors. Why did they flee from the battlefield and why did they leave uh, the battlefield was many factors, which were the triggering factor were that they were taken by surprise. They were taken in a total state of shock. The second is that after the martyrdom of Hazrat Musa bin Omer, who somehow resembled Prophet Sallallahu to some extent, there was a rumor which spread in the Muslim army that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been martyred. Moreover, when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself, he got injured and he fainted because of excessive bleeding, he fell down. And then another rumor spread again that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been martyred. So they lost hope, they were disappointed and they were detected and hence they left the battlefield. Now in the whole process, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was calling to calling to all of those companions who were running away from the battlefield. And Prophet Sallallahu was calling out, Ilayya ibadullah, Ilayya ibadullah, O servants of Allah, come towards me. But none of them, they, they did not pay any attention. And they were just like continuously running away, except a few, a very few sincere companions. They did respond to the call and they did come in this difficult time to uh, protect and guard Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One of them being Hazrat uh, Saad bin Abi Waqas. He came back and he really fought very, very bravely to protect and guard Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from all around. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called out to him, Ya Saad, Fidaqa, Abi wa Ummi, O Saad, my parents be sacrificed on you. And you know what? Hazrat Saad, عنه, he used to feel very happy and he used to feel uh, proud about it, about it, that no one had received these words from Prophet وسلم, amongst the companions other than him. And then there was Hazrat Talha bin Ubaid, عنه, he actually endangered his life for the sake of uh, protecting Prophet. وسلم. He was like doing three things simultaneously. He would attack the advancing enemy, the enemy, the soldiers of the enemy, they were who they were attacking Prophet from all the sides. He would attack all these uh, soldiers of the enemy. And at the same time, he was working to protect Prophet Sallallahu from their attack also. Like sometimes he was, he put forward his arm, his, his shoulder, his chest, his back in front of the swords of the enemy who were attacking Prophet Sallallahu so he was attacking the enemy themselves, trying to retreat them. And then when they attacked Prophet Sallallahu he was presenting before their swords his own body to protect Prophet Sallallahu And when for some time, for a short period, when the enemy retreated, then in that interim period, in that brief time, he would carry Prophet Sallallahu on his shoulder to shift him to a slightly higher and a safer place. And finally, he succeeded to shift Prophet Sallallahu to a safe place. But in the whole period, he had he had been injured so badly and he had bled that he collapsed and he fell in a ditch. And uh, then some other companions, Hazrat uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu, Hazrat Umar, anhu, and Hazrat Ubaida, Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, they came over to Prophet And the first thing which Prophet had told them was that you go and find how and what, in which condition is Abu Talha. And when they found out, he had 40 deep cuts and he had fainted and he had fallen. There he was lying in a deep ditch. And when Prophet was informed that he was still alive, he said that whoever wants to see a living martyr, he should see as a Talha, and he was also called as Al Khair after this battle. And then uh, the companions who came around to protect Prophet Sallallahu they saw that uh, he was he was um, excessively uh, injured. But before talking about what they did, I would want to mention about what my favorite, my beloved companion, Hazrat Umar, she did for Prophet Sallallahu You know, she had joined the Muslim army with her husband and with her elder son, Hazrat uh, Abdullah. 
Now she was, what she was doing was that she was giving water to the wounded soldiers and she was uh, dressing their wounds also. But when she saw that Prophet Sallallahu was alone and he was insecure, she called out to her son, Abdullah, that Abdullah, come along, let's protect Prophet Sallallahu This is what, this is a mother calling her son for the protection of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma ja'alna minhum, Allahumma ja'alna minhum. And she, she actually guarded Prophet Sallallahu all around him like a brave tigress. And there she was all around him. And then in the end, she was, she was wounded and she was injured and she fell. And after the battle, Prophet Sallallahu visited her. And he was so pleased with the way she had protected Prophet Sallallahu with the company of her son that he asked her, uh, Ume Amara, ask what you want to. But she did not ask for the wealth and property, the authority or power or anything of the sort. What she asked, she said, the Prophet Sallallahu please supplicate for me and for my family that we may be your neighbors in Jannah. And Prophet Sallallahu he raised his hands and he supplicated, Allahumma rafaqa ifil jannah. And she said that now I don't have any fear or any anxiety. Subhanallah. These were the companions. These were the sincere companions of Prophet Sallallahu who did not even, who did not even bother to lay their lives down for the protection of Prophet Sallallahu And then were the other companions, Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu, and Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah. They came and they found that there were two metal rings. They had pierced the cheek of Prophet Sallallahu They were piercing his flesh. And uh, Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, he encircled this metal ring with his teeth to open it up. And he took it out, but in the process, his tooth broke and blood started spurting out. And the second ring was still there. So he repeated the process again, and his second tooth also broke in the process. What pain and how much bleeding there was, but this was what? this In this battle of Ohot, all the companions, they, they clearly proved that the love of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for all of them was even more than the love for themselves. Now, such a love, such sincere sacrifices of the companions again, again brought the help of Allah and the support of Allah joined all of them and the enemy, <coughs> the enemy, despite being at the winning end by the will of Allah, they felt overpowered and by the support of Allah, they lost hope and they retreated. The enemy, despite the fact that they were in the winning position, they, they felt overpowered, they left their hope and they retreated, leaving the Muslims in the battlefield. And so what lessons and what models we learn from this whole event is that it is not the number it is not the number, the strength, the arms, the ammunition of the forces, of the armies, which is important. It is the behavior. It is the behavior and the manner which is decisive for the victory of the army, of the Muslim army. When the Muslim army, the, the people of the Muslim army, the Mujahideen, the soldiers of the Muslim army, they obey the orders of Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they stay patient. They stay patient in their obedience. And they have reliance in the promises of Allah. Then the help and the support of Allah befalls them. And we learn what? If you stay patient and if you fear Allah, then all their plans and all their tricks, they will not harm you to whatever they try and whatever they plan. This is what the events of Ohad they are highlighting for all of us, that as long as the Muslim army stays patience and obedience and fear of Allah, then even the greatest, even the greatest, the most powerful and the highly equipped of enemy forces will not be able to harm them. Allah help us all stay obedient 
help us all be perseverant and patient and help us all develop the fear of Allah and help us all be among those who rely in Allah. Hasbunallah, ni'am al-mawla wa ni'am al-wakil. Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu, alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Verse number 121. And remember when you left your family in the morning to post the believers at their stations. Which stations for the Battle of Uhud? Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu in the center, Hazrat Ali on the right, and Hazrat Mikdad bin Aswad on the left wing. And Allah is hearing and knowing. When the two parties among you were about to lose courage, but Allah was their ally, and upon Allah the believers should rely. Now this was when uh, Abdullah bin Ubay, he took away 250 of his companions, the hypocrites, the two tribes of Banu Salma and Banu Harsa, they also were double-minded and they were shaken. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them, uh, made them steadfast and they carried on to accompany the Muslim army. Verse 123, and already had Allah given you victory at the battle of Badr, while you were few in number, then fear Allah, perhaps you will be grateful. So Allah here is now reminding them of the victory of Badr just the last year. Remember, when you said to the believers, is it not sufficient for you that your Lord should reinforce you with 3,000 angels sent down? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise 3,000 angels being sent down? Is because the news had reached the Muslims that the Meccan army had 3,000 soldiers and they were advancing with an army of 3,000 soldiers towards Medina. Yes, if you remain patient and conscious of Allah and the enemy come upon you attacking in rage, your Lord will reinforce you with 5,000 angels having marks of distinction. So Allah promised 5,000 angels to make them even more relaxed and contented. And Allah made it not except as a sign of good tidings for you and to reassure your hearts thereby. And victory is not except from Allah, the exalted in might, the wise, that he might cut down a section of the disbelievers or suppress them so that they might turn back disappointed. Not for you, but for Allah is the decision whether he should cut them down or forgive them, or punish them, for indeed they are wrongdoers. And to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. O you who have believed, do not consume, usually doubled and multiplied, but fear Allah that you may be successful." In these verses 130 to 133, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned a don't of Allah regarding interest or regarding the consumption of usury. Now, the first thing which we need to understand is that why during the discussion of events of the Battle of Uhud has Allah talked about the consumption of usury? This is because Abu Sufyan, the leader of Quraysh now, Abu Sufyan had announced that all the money they will collect from usury, all the people of Quraysh and the people of Makkah, all the money which they will collect from interest, it will be used for the preparation of an army against the Muslims. Now, since now here in Uhud, Muslims, they had suffered a heavy loss, 70 lives and many of the Muslims injured, so because of this heavy loss, uh, the Makkans, they had been victorious. And then there was a chance that the Muslims, they might start thinking and they might start assuming that interest is useful and helpful in certain situations. So to rule out any such thought, so to rule out any such thought which might crop up in the mind of Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has negated here the consumption of usury in these verses. Uh, 
Now, regarding uh, the interest and usury or riba, this is the second verse according to the order of revolution. The first verse was revealed in Surah Rum, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had just conveyed a dislike of interest and uh, was clearly um, uh, no uh, no uh, no announcement of usury being unlawful was made there in the verses of Surah Rum. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has just conveyed a dislike of uh, consumption or using taking advantage of interest has been announced. Now here, although the verse does not announce the hurrimat or the unlawful, being unlawful of usury, but where very, very clearly does Allah disapprove of any form of riba being taken by the Muslims. Allah says what? Allah says, la ta'kulu, do not consume usury, that so it is a clear cut do of don't of Quran. La taqulu is what? A clear cut don't of Quran. Allah is forbidding the Muslims to take all forms of usury. The second Allah says, Wattaqullah, fear Allah. So to be pious, to be God fearing, we need to do what? We need to stay away from interest. And then Allah says, La Allah kum tuflihun, to be successful. To be successful here and hereafter, we need to do what? We need to refrain from usury. And then Allah says, fear the fire. So to escape the fire, to escape the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers, we need to do what? We need to stay away from all forms of riba. And then Allah says, in the verse next, Allah says, Atiullah, obey Allah. Atiullah wa atiul Rasul, that you may obtain mercy. So to obey Allah and to obey the Prophet sallallahu we need to refrain from all forms of riba. And to obtain the mercy of Allah, we need to stay away from riba. And then Allah says, Wasariu. That if we want to hasten towards the forgiveness and we want to hasten towards the attainment of Jannah, we need to we need to forego all forms of interest and all forms of riba. So this is this is not the this is not the final order regarding riba. But still, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned it to be a source of piety. It is a source of success in this world here and hereafter. It is a source of release or escape from hellfire to obey and for the obedience of Allah and his prophet to acquire the mercy of Allah and to hasten towards forgiveness and for the attainment of Jannah. We need what? We need to refrain from all forms of riba. And finally, the final and the third order regarding the riba and usury was in the verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which we've already gone through. So now in this verse, 133, Allah says what? Sari wa ila rabbikum. Hasten towards the forgiveness from your Lord. And what? And, and Jannah the gardens which are like what as wide as the heavens and the earth and they have been what they have been prepared for whom or right that lil muttaqin or right that lil muttaqin they have been prepared for the righteous and for the pious so the first thing we learn from here is that jannah has been prepared. Jannah is there. It is very much there. Jannah is existent and Jannah is ready for the pious and for the righteous. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Now in these verses, in this verse and the following few verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the bondsmen to hurry and to hasten towards the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attain the to attain the bounties and to attain the destination of Jannah. And Jannah is being promised for whom? For the God-fearing, for the pious and for the righteous. And then in the next few verses, verses 134 to 136, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the manners, explains the traits of these 
God-fearing, pious, right to people who will be blessed with the blessings and the bounties of Jannah. Allah, help us remember all these manners and adopt all these traits in our personality also. So the, the manners and the traits of the muttaqeen or the pious people who will be blessed with Jannah is what? Those who do what? Who spend in the cause of Allah when during ease and hardships and who restrain anger and who pardon the people and Allah loves the doers of good. So the first manner of those of the pious who will who have been promised as the blessing of Jannah is that they spend in the path of Allah. They spend in the path of Allah to trade for and to barter for the gifts of Jannah. They spend charity in the path of Allah. And they spend both conditions in ease and in hardships. Because, you know, generally, we do see two forms of responses that you see that either people, they spend in ease. That is when they have surplus and when they are, they are in a condition of afford affordability. They, they spend, but they fail to spend when they are slightly economically, they are economically tied and they have economic restraints then or in any other hardships, they do not spend, but they just spend when they have an affordability. And the second category we do come across, they just spend when a calamity strikes them to ease the hardships and to let go of the crisis or to escape the crisis they spend in the path of Allah. But they tend to forget, they tend to forget spending in the path of Allah when they are being blessed with the bounties of Allah and when they have an affordability also. So, but the God-fearing, pious people are those, the inmates of the Jannah will be those who spend in all the conditions and all the states. And the second manner of the pious people is those who will be blessed with the blessings of Jannah is those who do what? They restrain their anger. I never knew. I never knew till I had gone through this verse of Surah Al-Imran that we would also need to restrain our anger to get to Jannah. That containing our, controlling our anger will also be needed for us to land up in Jannah. I did not know that. Only did I realize and when I went through this verse of Surah Al-Imran. For entering Jannah, we need to restrain our anger and we need to swallow our anger. al qadimin al ghais means what? Means those people, they swallow their anger. Swallowing their anger means what? Because you know, when you swallow, when you swallow a sip of water or when you swallow any liquid, the person who has swallowed, nobody will know. Nobody will know until the person is seeing swallowing the liquid. Nobody would be able to say that the person has taken a drink. So swallowing anger means what? To, to restrain or control the anger in a manner that it does not even show any signs, no signs of anger, no, no signs in form of an expression on the face, no body movements, no, no nothing by the word of mouth, nothing at all to show that the person was angry or the person was furious by no, by no forms does it show. So this is how we need to restrain anger that the person we are facing just, just, doesn't, just doesn't know and just doesn't realize that we were angry or we were furious. So this is how a person to get Jannah needs to restrain the anger. Self-restraint, how important it is. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reports in Bukhari that Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam has said that um, Hazrat Abu Huraira uh, said that a person asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam that give me some good advice. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam replied, do not lose your temper. The, ma the man kept on asking the question repeatedly and Prophet sallallahu alayhi sallam kept on answering the same words, do not lose your temper. So losing temper is what? It is an undesirable habit. And the four traits and the four uh, manners of a hypocrite as have been reported in 
uh, tradition of Bukhari and Muslim that ayatul munafiqu ruba'a is a hadasa qazaba, is a ahada, is a ahada akhlafa, is a tumana khana. And the last is, is a khasama fajara, that when he fights, when he gets in a fight, he does what? He just simply erupts, he breaks out. So this is just being furious, just being angry. This is an undesirable habit. Under the influence of anger, a person will not be, will neither be able to uh, follow and care for the divine injunctions and nor for his own gain or loss also. And the person in a state of anger, he becomes a, he becomes a plaything in the hands of the devil and just lets loose. So that is why Prophet Wasallam has instructed us in many words of ahadith how we have to go about to control our anger. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he reports in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet Wasallam said that he is not a wrestler who overpowers his rival, but the wrestler is the one he who keeps himself under control when roused to anger. You know, it really needs a lot of willpower and it needs a lot of emotional strength to control the anger and to control, uh, to have restraint over the anger. Similarly, Hazrat Abu Zar Ghaffari, who he reports in Musa Ahmad and Tarimdi, that Prophet said that when any one of you is roused to anger, he should sit down if he is standing. And if the anger subsides as a result of this, well and good. And if it does not, he should lie down. So this is what? A form of a psychological remedy for controlling one's, uh, one's anger. Hazrat Ibn Abbas, who he has reported in Musa Ahmad, that Prophet said, Instruct the people in religion, teach religion, and make education easy. Do not make it difficult. And when any one of you is feeling angry, he should keep quiet. And the narrator added that Prophet said these last three words thrice, that when anyone feels angry, he should keep quiet. He repeated this thrice. So staying quiet is also a very effective tool of, um, of restraining anger. Because, you know, when two people indulging in a fight, both go on debating and both go on uh, continuing their fight and their dialogue, then obviously the fight will prolong and there are chances of letting loose with the person's anger but when one of them keeps quiet then obviously the fight also just subsides and it becomes easier for the person to control the anger also has atiya bin orva asadi she uh, reports in uh, uh, has been related uh, in abu daud that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that anger is roused under the influence of shaitan and shaitan has been created from fire and fire is put out with water. So when any one of you is seized with anger, let him perform wudu. So we can perform wudu when we are angry or we can take a bath or we can do what? We can also drink water. And this is the suggestion of the words of Hadith. And similarly, as we learn from this word, uh, from this uh, from this tradition, that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, uh, has instructed that it is because of shaitan. So making zikr and remembrance of Allah, like saying, A'uzu billahi bin shaitan rajim will also help us contain our anger. Because we know that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told all of us that there are two compartments of the heart in one is an angel and in the second part is the is the devil is shaitan and when we remember or we make remembrance of allah then the shaitan flees so when we are in a state of fury what we need to do is we need to glorify allah we need to remember allah we need to say like a'uzu billahi minash shaitan rajim here in a state of fury is the best form of remembrance of Allah because here we are remembering Allah and we are also seeking his protection against shaitan. Or the verses which Allah has mentioned in Quran, If we start reciting these verses, obviously 
we will get contented we will get uh, we will get tranquility as allah says ala bi zikrillahi tatma'innu al qulub and this tranquility and this sakina and this peace of mind will also help us restrain our anger and this remembrance of allah will make shaitan flee from there and this will save us from the attacks of shaitan which are going to which are going to misguide us to let loose during our anger and that is we also see from an incident in the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came across a person who was who was fighting and he was angry and he was furious that his face had gone red with because of his rage and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at him and he said that i know of words if he recites those then he will be able to restrain his anger and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed that these words are what a'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim so this is another suggestion that we drink water we make wudu and we recite these two verses of quran to contain to restrain our anger and why should we do this as has been reported by hazrat abdullah bin umar and mustad ahmad the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that no one drank a draft superior no one drank a draft superior in the sight of allah to the draft of anger that has that was drunk with the intention of earning his good player and what is the reward what is the reward is what we learn from uh, an incident in the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that hazrat abu bakr siddiq and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were sitting together that a bed to win he came and he started insulting a pro hazrat umar razil hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu and he was abused him and he was ill mannered to start with initially hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he was um, he was in a total state of um, he was quiet he was silent and he just uh, restrained his anger and he just kept quiet why hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu kept quiet and he was silent he noticed that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a smile he was he had a smile on his face and uh, but when hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu he could tolerate no longer and he could not uh, stand any longer the abusive manner of that uh, bedouin then he started answering back and he started responding to what he was saying and then prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam immediately got up and he left hazrat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was so upset he thought that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had got angry so he went after him and then he also asked the reason why all this happened this way and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him that abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu why when you were silent and he was being ill mannered to you and you were restraining your anger and you were pardoning him then i was seeing and i was informed that there was an angel by the order of allah who was standing behind you and through all the period of your silence and your self control that this angel was supplicating for you and was seeking forgiveness for you but when when you started answering back also then i saw that the angel left and a devil and shaitan came there so that is why i got up and i left so this is a reward of the person who restrains anger and just keeps control of the anger and does not respond or retaliate uh, to the to the to the misbehavior that the person is being exposed to as a sahal bin maaz radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu has reported in tirmizi and abu daud the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that whoever drinks his anger when he is in a position to quench it that is to suppress the anger solely for the sake of allah although he can he can give vent to his feelings and refrain from visiting his wrath upon the person who incurs it allah will call him to himself in the presence of everyone on the day of resurrection and allah will tell him to choose whichever bride he likes from among the brides of heaven so this will be the reward of the person who who does what who exhibits self control and who restrains anger hazrat anas radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu reports that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that one if one guards his tongue 
if one any person guards his tongue allah will conceal his secrets if one restrains his anger allah will keep his punish, punishment from him on the day of resurrection and if one makes his excuses to allah allah will accept his excuse similarly hazrat ibn abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he reports in muslim that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there are two habits of yours that are pleasing to allah one is forbearance forbearance that is not to be overcome with anger and the other is not to act in a state of hurry so when somebody uh, infuriates us and when somebody uh, irritates us then just uh, acting in haste and being overcome by our anger and to lose control of ourselves this is disliked by allah for all the believers now we do realize that it is somehow very difficult but it was done by all the companions it was done by the prophets and we uh, there was an incident in the life of imam zainul abidin he went through all controlling of anger and forgiving and everything now let me um, complete the verse first that the first uh, manner was that they spent and the second thing is that they restrain their anger now when they restrain their anger what do they do the next thing is they they pardon the people they pardon the people after restraining their anger and after controlling their furious feelings what do they do they do not build them up they do not build them up so that one fine morning the whole the volcano of the anger it just erupts no instead they do what they forgive they pardon the people who had wronged them because why because prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has told all of us forgive if you want to be forgiven and it is reported in a tradition that one who forgives allah will forgive him on the day of judgment and then after forgiving what do they do allah loves the doers of good allah loves the doers of good that is finally they do what they are al muhsinin they control their anger they control their fury then they forgive they pardon and then finally they they do good to the person who had wronged them this looks like next to impossible this looks humanly impossible it looks like an angel but in the stories of the prophets in the stories of companions we do see all these being done we see all this being done imam zainul abidin imam zainul abidin had a slave and she was helping him performing wudu and she was assisting him by pouring the water for wudu and what happened was that immediately water fell as a splash and all his all his uh, dress got wet and he was angry and he was furious and he he raised his hand to hit the slave the slave woman he he raised his hand but then she started reciting this verse wal qasimin al ghais so he dropped his hand and he stopped the he gave away the intention of hitting her and beating her and punishing her and then she said wa afina an nas and he immediately responded and he said okay i forgive you and i pardon you for what you did and then she said wallahu yuhibbul muhsinin that allah loves the doers of good and he immediately answered okay fine i free you for the sake of allah so these were the companions they actually responded they actually reciprocated to the verses of quran and then imam bukhari uh, a person came over and uh, he was uh, abusive and he was uh, he was um, not respecting him and he was dishonoring imam bukhari and he was calling him by bad names and he was ill mannered to imam bukhari but imam bukhari he just kept quiet and he was silent and he did not answer back and the next day he went to pay him a visit that person who had been ill mannered to him the previous day imam bukhari he went with a gift of a book and he presented him with this gift and the person he was so shocked and the person he was so upset and he 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 mentioned that the previous day i had behaved with you with ill manner and i was bad temper to you and i was abusive and disrespectful to you and now you come over visiting with uh, visiting me and giving me this gift of a book imam bukhari 
told him that the gift of the book is because is in lieu of the good deeds which you had transferred in my account while you were being disrespectful and abusive towards me. So this is the self-control and this is the forbearance, the patience and constraining of the anger by an imam and by the companions. And we do come across the behavior and the manner of Hazrat Yaqub alayhi salam. Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam in Surah Yusuf also. Hazrat Yusuf alayhi salam calling out what? La tasriba alaykum al yom. There is no accountability for you today. He called out these words of forgiveness, these words of being pardoned to whom? To his brothers, the brothers who had been jealous, who had been hard hearted, who had planned his murder, who had threw him in the well because of whom all the hardships he had to face in his life because of their activity, because of their planning. He had been through all these hardships in his life, facing them, what does he come up with? He says, La tasriba alaykum al So remember, it is not humanly impossible to restrain anger and to forgive and then finally do good to the person who, who, was, who was incurring all this. Prophet has been seen to do all this so many times in his life. At the conquest of Makkah, at the conquest of Makkah, Prophet forgave whom? Ikrama bin Abu Jahl, the son of Abu Jahl, Hind, Hind who had caused, who has caused the death of Hazrat, Hazrat Hamza radiallahu ta'ala and her, and who? And then Prophet forgave the daughter-in-law of Abu Jahl, Umm Hakim, and there it is Hind, and accompanying, accompanying Hind is Umm Hakim. They walk in after the conquest of Makkah, and Prophet Sallallahu says what? Marhaba ya Hind, welcome to Islam, Hind. How patient, what forbearance, how forgiving, and what a doing of good deeds. And then Prophet Sallallahu pardoned Usman bin Talha. He was, he was the key bearer of haram. And when during his stay in Makkah, Prophet Sallallahu had asked him to open the haram because he wanted to visit inside the haram. Talha, Usman bin Talha, he had very, uh, he had very aggressively, he had humiliated Prophet Sallallahu and he had been now very disrespectful and he had refused to open the, open the door of Haram. But on the day of conquest of Makkah, Usman bin Talha was called and he was summoned and he was, he was like shivering with fear and he, he thought that he will be beheaded. But Prophet Sallallahu forgave him. And he handed him over the keys and he announced that from this day till the day of judgment, the keys will be, the key bearers will be the family of Usman bin Talha. This was, this was forbearance. This was patience. This was restraining of anger. This was pardoning. And this was what? This was sheer and simple goodness with Usman bin Talha. Prophet Sallallahu even pardoned Samama bin Usan, who had planned the murder of Prophet Sallallahu On the day of conquest of Makkah, standing in front of him were those who had caused, who had caused as a Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and had to fall from the she camel when she was migrating towards Madina. And she was expecting, and it led to her abortion and miscarriage. Even Prophet Sallallahu forgave all of them no personal revenge, total control of anger, pardoning everyone. This was out of sheer goodness and kindness and forgiveness. This is the manner of whom, regarding whom we have been instructed in Surah Ahzab, لَقَدْ قَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ The model of excellence is the model of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was forbearing, who was patient, who would restrain anger, who would forgive and pardon, and who would then do what? Do kindness and do goodness to those who were bad to him, who had wronged him. And then the remaining manners of those who are pious and who will be blessed with Jannah and those who, when they commit an immorality, 
who when they commit immorality or wrong themselves by transgression, they remember Allah and they seek forgiveness for their sins. Who can forgive sins except Allah and who do not persist in what they have done while they know those those their reward is forgiveness from their lords and gardens beneath which rivers flow in paradise wherein they will abide eternally and excellent is the reward of the righteous workers so the final uh, trait of the fifth trait of the people of jannah and the god-fearing pious people is what that they turn towards allah when they commit sin when they commit sin, they do what? They turn towards Allah. Remember to err is human. As Prophet Wasallam has been reported that he said, Kullu bani adama khattan, khayrul tawwabun. All the human beings, all the sons of Adam Islam, they err, they err, they are but supposed to commit sins. It is a human instinct, they will err. But the best of those who err or commit sins are whom? Who repent, who repent, who seek forgiveness. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al So, the proper the behavior of those inmates of Jannah is that when they commit a sin, they fear Allah, they turn towards Allah seeking forgiveness and repenting for their sins. And they stubbornly and obstinately, they do not stick on to the sin and they do not carry on justifying or covering up their wrongdoings and sins. Instead, they confess, they accept, they confess, they regret, they repent, they seek forgiveness and they make promises and they ask for help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to rectify themselves, to reform themselves, and to improve themselves. Similar situations as yours have passed on before you. So proceed throughout the earth and observe how was the end of those who denied this Quran is a clear statement to all the people and a guidance and instruction for those conscious of Allah. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. So do not weaken and do not grieve and you will be superior if you are the true believers. Now in these verses and the following verses also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to console the companions. After they had suffered the heavy loss of the battle of Uhud, 70 of the Muslims, they were martyred, 70 Mujahideen, they were seriously injured and wounded, many women, they were widowed, many children were, were orphaned, so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consoling them that this was just a trial. It was just a trial and ultimately the superiority and victory will be yours provided when, provided if you are the believers, you obey Allah and you are obedient to Allah and Prophet Wasallam, then victory will finally be, will, will be with you. Verse number 140, if a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. So Allah is con uh, consoling the companions, telling that if this year 70 of you have been martyred, so just the previous year in the battle of Badr, you happened to kill 70 of them also. So you inflicted on them a similar loss the previous year. So now, previous year, you inflicted a loss on them, and this year, as a trial, you have been inflicted by a similar trial also. So if, you, if a wound should touch you, there has already touched the opposing people a wound similar to it. And these days of varying condition, these days of varying conditions, we alternate among the people so that Allah may make evident those who believe and may take himself from among you martyrs. And Allah does not like the wrongdoers. So Allah is clearly explaining that this is what? This is a period of trial. And Allah wants to check out the believers from the disbelievers and Allah wants to bless some of you with the blessings and with the rewards of of what Allah, Allah, Allah blesses the martyrs. 
141, and that Allah may purify the believers through trials and destroy the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that why are they being put into trial? Because Allah wants to differentiate between the believers and the non-believers, the obedience and the disobedience. Verse 142, or do you think that you will enter paradise while Allah has not yet made evident those of you who fight in his cause and made evident those who were steadfast. So in this verse, Allah is explaining that to make a decision for whom he will be blessing with the rewards of Jannah, you have been put into this trial. And you had certainly wished for martyrdom before you encountered it, and you have now seen it before you while you were looking on. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or to be killed, would you turn back on your heels to unbelief? And he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. Now, this is being said in this verse because the companions, when they had received the rumor that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had passed away, they had this, they had received the news of martyrdom of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had been demoralized and they had left the battlefield. So here Allah says, that were you fighting for the cause of Allah? Were you fighting for the sake of Allah? Or were you fighting for the sake of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So they have been giving, they have been given a jolting and they have been uh, highlighted as to what wrong they did during the battle of Uhud. And it is not, it is not possible for one to die except by the permission of Allah at a decree determined. And whoever desires the reward of this world, we will give him thereof. And whoever desires the reward of hereafter, we will give him thereof. And we will reward the grateful. Rabbi Aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma ja'alli saburan wa ja'alli shakura wa ja'alli fi aini saghira wa fi a'yunin nasi qabira. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina azab al-nar. Verse 146, and how many a prophet they fought and with him fought many religious scholars, but they never lost assurance due to what afflicted them in the cause of Allah, nor did they weaken or submit. And Allah loves the steadfast. Now in this verse, the people of Medina, all the people of Medina, and even we, all the followers of the Ummah Prophet Wasallam, we are being told, and the companions of Prophet Wasallam, they are being reassured, telling them that you are not the first group of people who are being exposed to all the trials of battles or the trials of being defeated and of, uh, of finding hardships and crises of battles. You are not the first group of people who are being exposed to all these trials. The followers of the previous prophets also, they were subjected to such trials of battles and hardships and crises also. How did they behave? How did they behave and what behavior they exhibited that Allah liked? They were what? Allah says, Fama wahinu. They were not demoralized. They were not disappointed. They were not disheartened or dejected. And then Allah says, Wama zurafu. They, they were not weakened. And then Wama staqanu. they did not lose power. <coughs> they did not lose power. They did not lose their perseverance and willpower. And Wama staqanu means they did not submit. They did not submit or surrender to the enemies. They did not reconcile. They did not compromise with the enemies out of the fear of the enemy. So, and they were steadfast and they were perseverance in the obedient and in the reliance of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing, showing the companions and all of us also the behavior of the followers 
which Allah approved, which Allah liked, which pleased Allah, is guiding all of us to adopt the similar manner, not to be dejected, not to be disappointed, not to lose heart, not to uh, not to weaken out, not to submit or surrender to the enemy, but to stay steadfast and perseverant in the obedience of Allah. And their words were, the words of all those followers, the behavior which Allah has liked, what did they do? Their words were not, but they said, our Lord, forgive us our sins and the excess committed in our affairs and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So what else did the believer, the, the followers of the previous prophets do, which Allah liked? They did was, they did remembrance. They remembered Allah, they glorified and exalted Allah, and remembering Allah, they returned towards Allah, supplicating, supplicating to Allah for victory, for steadfastness, for perseverance of faith and belief, and they returned towards Allah, seeking forgiveness. So this is the behavior. Remember, seeking forgiveness and supplicating to Allah and remembering Allah, glorifying Allah is what? All these are, they are the arms, they are the ammunition, they are the strength of the Mujahideen for fighting in the cause of Allah. So what happened to them? These followers of the previous prophets who exhibited all this behavior and who returned to Allah seeking forgiveness and supplicating for his help, what happened to such followers? What happened to them? You know what? People in routine, they would have labeled them as fanatics. They would have been called as fanatics and maniacs. They, were, they must have been called as people who are mentally sick, insane to behave like this. Now, what happened to these fanatics? Were they defeated? Were they defeated by their powerful enemies? No, what happened was... Allah gave them the reward of this world and the good reward of hereafter. And Allah loves the doers of good. So what happened is they received with the will of Allah the worldly bounties of success and they were rewarded in hereafter also. O you who have believed, if you obey those who disbelieve, they will turn you back on your heels and you will then become losers. But Allah is your protector and he is the best of helpers. We will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve for what they have associated with Allah or which he had not sent down any authority and their refuge will be the fire and wretched is the residence of the wrongdoers. And Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you. Allah had certainly fulfilled his promise to you when you were killing the enemy by his permission until the time when you lost courage and fell to disputing about the order given by Prophet Sallallahu and disobeyed after he had shown you that which you love. Among you are some who desire this world, and among you are some who desire the hereafter. Then he turned you back from them, defeated that he might test you, and he has already forgiven you, and Allah is the possessor of bounty for the believers." Now, in this verse 152, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained the exact state of affairs with the underlying reasons. Now, this is being done, why? Because after the losses the Muslims had to suffer in the Battle of Uhud, the hypocrites of Medina, they started criticizing. And they started saying that the promises made by Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had not been fulfilled. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had promised victory. Muslims had been promised victory with the help of Allah. But on the contrary, the Muslims, they had to suffer such heavy physical and monetary losses. Now to answer all this and to rectify any suspicion in the hearts of believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave all this explanation. Allah said that as long, as long as in the first part of the battle, as long the Muslims, they obeyed. They obeyed Allah. 
and they stayed patient and they relied. They relied on the help of Allah, then Allah helped them. And they were victorious. As we learn from the traditions that the companions did report, that we saw that the army of the Quraysh, they were fleeing back from the battlefield. And we saw that the ladies of the Quraysh, they were also running, and they were running in terror, and they were raising their garments to expose their legs. So initially, with the help of Allah, the Muslims were victorious. When their behavior was what Allah had disliked and what Allah had ordered and what Allah had enjoined and what Allah wanted them the way to behave, they were, they were obedient, they were patient, they were reliant. Then with the help of Allah, victory, victory came to them. But when? But when they, out of the love of the riches and the wealth, they had indulged in disobedience of Allah and his prophet, then help of Allah and his blessings were withdrawn and heavy losses were inflicted on them. And why were these heavy losses inflicted on them? Well, because of their own disobedience, because of their own lack of patience and obedience were they to face these heavy losses. So that is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly explained in these verses, highlighting the disobedience and the incorrect conduct of the, of the companions. Uh, the, Allah further explains in verse 153, remember, remember when you fled and climbed the mountain without looking aside at anyone while the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was calling you from behind. What was he calling out? He was saying, when he was left all by himself unprotected in the battlefield. So Allah repaid you with distresses upon distress, so you would not grieve for that which had escaped you of victory and spoils of war, or for that which had befallen you of injury and death. And Allah is fully acquainted with what you do. So the disobedience and the incorrect conduct is further being highlighted and explained. That is, when Prophet ﷺ was injured and he was unsafe and he was calling for protection, they had failed to respond. So this verse not only highlights the condition of the battlefield of Uhud, instead of that to all the Muslims, it is not just making comment and debating on the situation of the people of Medina, but to all the Muslims of all the times, of all the countries, it points out the underlying causes of crises, of trials and hardships. And as today, we do realize that the Muslim Ummah at all levels is going through a very, very difficult time, hard times. The Muslims are being persecuted the Muslims are exposed to all forms of physical, social, psychological, emotional crises of all sorts. What we need to analyze today is, and what we need to realize today is, that this, all these trials, these persecutions of the Ummah today are why? Because of our own disobedient behaviors, because of our own transgressions, and what we need to do at at all levels of Ummah, at all levels of all the Muslim countries, we need to do is that we need to analyze. We need to analyze and we need to confess. We need to confess at all levels what we have been disobeying Quran and Hadith, indulging in the love of the world. We've not been bothered about protection of protection of the laws of Quran, about teaching, preaching, implementation of Quran. We have, just, we have just been forgetful. We've just not been bothered about this duty of ours, which has been assigned to us, calling us kuntum khaira ummatin. We need to accept all this. We need to seek forgiveness with promises of rectification, with promises of reforming ourselves with the help of Allah, and with promising of leaving all our follies and turning as obedient servants of Allah, as submitting, surrendering servants of Allah, working for the cause of Dava, working for the cause of protection of the laws of Allah, working for the cause of implementation of the rules and regulations of Allah on the land of Allah. Then after distress, 
He sent down upon you security in the form of drowsiness, overcoming a faction of you, while another faction worried about themselves, thinking of Allah other than the truth, the thought of ignorance, saying, is there anything for us to have done in this matter? So in this verse, in the starting part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that after the Muslims were put into trial and they were giving a jolting to make them realize how disobedient they had been out of the love of, uh, out because of the love of uh, money and the love of riches, they've been given a jolting. But then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them send them down drowsiness and uh, companions themselves, they report that we all were drowsy and we were raising our hands and arms with our swords, but our hands would fall back down and we were all drowsy and we were blessed with tranquility from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down angels to fight for the Muslims and the Muslims were then protected. And then the other faction who said was the, the, uh, the hypocrites. They said, is there anything for us to have done in this matter? Say, indeed, the matter belongs completely to Allah. They conceal within themselves what they will not reveal to you. They say, if there was anything we could have done in this matter, some of us would not have been killed right here. So it was the hypocrites. They started saying that if you had accepted our suggestion of staying back in Medina and fighting and facing the, uh, the enemies from within the city, you had taken our suggestions, then all this would not have happened. So their behavior has been mentioned and they are being answered. They say that if there was anything we could have done in the matter, some of us would not have been killed right here. Say, even if you had been inside your houses, those decreed to be killed would have come out to their deathbeds. It was so that Almighty Allah might test what is in your breasts and purify what is in your hearts. And Allah is knowing of that within the breasts. Indeed, those of you who turned back on that day, the two armies met, it was shaitan who caused them to slip because of some blame they had earned. This was what, this is what, this is the comment of Allah and the punishment of the hypocrites who are led by Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, a group of 250 people they had went back to Medina. But Allah has already forgiven them. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and forbearing. O you who have believed, do not be like those who disbelieved and say about their brothers when they traveled through the land or went out to fight. If they had been with us, they would not have died or would not have been killed. So Allah makes that misconception a regret within their hearts. And it is Allah who gives life and causes death. And Allah is seeing of what you do. In this verse, what we learn is that in the life of a believer, in the life of a Muslim, there are no regrets. There are no regrets, ifs and buts about the past. About the past, the believer does not regret and saying something like that, I wish I had not done this because of which I suffered. I wish I had not gone there because of which something wrong happened to me. Remember, a believer who has faith in faith and decree does not regret in the happenings of the past. The only relationship, the only relationship of the believer with the past is, is his accountability of his deeds in the past, of confession of his sins in the past, and then repenting and seeking forgiveness for the sins in the past. And then his behavior and relationship in the present is to work to eradicate the sins, to rectify the disobediences, and to reform and improve himself in the present. And for the future, it is what? The fear of hereafter and working for the hereafter. And if you are killed in the cause of Allah or you die, then forgiveness from Allah and mercy are better than whatever you accumulate in this world. 
and whether you die or are killed unto Allah, you will be gathered. So by the mercy from Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult them in the matter. And when you have decided, then rely upon Allah. Indeed, Allah loves those who rely upon them. In this verse 159, Allah has explained the manner and the traits of Prophet وسلم, as a leader. As a leader, as the head of state, as an army chief, as the chief justice, these were all the designations and posts of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this verse explains the manner of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a leader. The verse itself very, very comprehensively is providing to us the best training for the head of department. We, we do see people going and um, going and attending courses for leadership training and man management training courses. This verse itself is the most comprehensive leader training leadership training course. And this very comprehensively provides a man management training course. The head of the department, the leader of a group needs to be what? Needs to be kind, merciful, soft-hearted, lenient, patient, behaving with forbearance, should, should not be rude and harsh, bad and ill-tempered, and should not be harsh in his language and conversation, should have forbearance and patience, should be pardoning, forgiving, and then should do what? Shavir Humfil Amr should make consultation, should be seeing counseling his juniors and subordinates. This is an order of Quran. Counseling with the subordinates, counseling with the juniors is what? It is an order of Quran and it is a sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you know, this counseling and making consultation with the subordinates, it is, it is a very useful thing. And it is very important and it brings very positive results and outcomes. Because you know, when all the companions, when they are involved in a counseling and consultation is made with them, they feel as if they have been respected and they have been given importance. Rather than just, just dictating and announcing a decision that, okay, like a dictator, the head of the department or the leader just comes one fine morning and announcing, okay, fine, as a dictator, I announce this will happen and so and so and such and such will be doing this. And this is just a simple announcement and a dictation. Consultation, contrary to that, it creates a positive environment, a feeling of involvement, a feeling of participation. And all the members, they feel as if they have been involved. And then what happens is they take it up as, as their own project and they collectively work to make it a success. And plus, another thing is more minds thinking, more minds thinking, more suggestions coming from sincere people. They will definitely come up with useful suggestions and positive ideas and um, things will also work out in a better way. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has suggested here the leaders of uh, any head of department or any leader to equip themselves with all these qualities and traits. If Allah should aid you, no one can overcome you. But if he should forsake you, who is there who can aid you after him? And upon Allah, let the believers rely. It is not attributable to any prophet that he would act unfaithfully in regard to war booty. And whoever betrays, taking unlawfully, will come with what he took on the day of resurrection. Then will every soul be fully compensated for what it earned, and they will not be wronged. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining that it is not It is not attributable for any prophet to act unfaithfully regarding the war of booty. 
Now, why is this being said is that because some of the people who had been appointed as archers, as guards of the mountain pass, they had developed a feeling and a fear that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will na'uzu billah, summa na'uzu billah min zalik. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam might also be unfair and let the people collecting the booty keep it and they will be deprived of their lawful share. So it is being clarified here that regarding Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this behavior of being unfair or not being just is simply not attributable. It is unattributable to assume or to have any thought or any assumption of the sort. Similarly, this verse is also revealed regarding an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was accompanied with his companions and there he received a gift sent to him by Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who, who had who was visiting Iraq. Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who had sent him four raw pieces of gold as in the form of a gold ore, a rock of four, four rocks of raw gold. They were in a leather pocket and they were sent by Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who as a gift to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa It was his own personal gift sent to him by his son-in-law. It was his personal belonging. It was not a booty. It was not anything of the Baytul Mal. It was just a personal belonging of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his personal gift. But Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he looked around and he distributed these to few of his companions would, whom he thought were deserving. So there was a person in the, in the gathering, he got up. And he very aggressively, and he, now Zubillah, very disrespecting Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he called out that, oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you fear Allah. Immediately, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very, uh, he constrained, he restrained his anger, and he was in a very, uh, in a, a forbearing manner, he answered back that, am I not the most God-fearing among all of you? And then he again called back very loud and very disrespectful manner, now Zubillah, he said, that, O oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, be just. Fear Allah and be just. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again added that, am I not the most fear among all of you? But he still stuck up to the way he was behaving and he just jerked aggressively his head and he left the gathering stamping his feet very aggressively. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he was overwhelmed and he was very angry and he just stood up and he asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that if you allow me, I behead him. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stopped him and he said that no people would say that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa started started beheading people from his own gatherings and his own companions. But at the same time, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa also informed that very soon, very soon in his offsprings and in his progenies, there will be people who will just recite and listen to the Quran, will just enjoy, will just enjoy listening to the recitation of Quran, but nothing will enter their souls. Nothing will lower down their throats, will enter their souls, and they will, they will leave religion just like an arrow leaves its place. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. So regarding this uh, event, this verse was revealed. So is the one who pursues the player of Allah like the one who brings upon himself the anger of Allah and whose refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. They are varying degrees in the sight of Allah and Allah is seeing of whatever they do. Certainly did Allah confer great favor upon the believers when he sent among them a messenger from themselves, doing what? Reciting to them his verses and purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom, although they had been before in manifest error. In this verse number 164, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained what has been explained in similar verses of Quran other than this also. Four times in Quran has similar verses been revealed, twice in Surah Al-Baqarah, once in Surah Al-Imran, this verse 164, and once in Surah Jummah. 
in these four verses has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted the four steps the four essential steps adopted by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the teaching and for the preaching of the Quran and Hadith. And for the implementation, the four steps of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first being the recitation of the verses of Quran, followed by the teaching and explaining the messages of these verses. And then by actually by his Hadith and by his Sunnah, teaching them and training them with the hikmah and with the wisdom and purifying and training them and reforming them. So these were the four steps, the four steps which led to the greatest ever human revolution on this earth. The biggest ever revolution which changed the minds, which changed the mindsets, the society, the customs, the norms of the Arab society were revolutionarily changed because of these four steps being conducted by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have been mentioned four times in Quran. Why is it that when a single disaster struck you on the day of Uhud, although you had struck the enemy in the battle of Badr with one twice as great, you said, from where is this? Say, it is from yourselves. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. And what struck you on the day the two armies met was by the permission of Allah that he might make evident the true believers and that he might make evident those who are hypocrites. For it was said to them, come, fight in the way of Allah, or at least defend. They said, if we had known there would be fighting, we would have followed you. They were nearer to disbelief that day than to faith, saying with their mouths what was not in their hearts, and Allah is more knowing of what they conceal. Those who said about their brothers while sitting at home, if they had obeyed us, what was who was saying all this? Allah has quoted what the hypocrites were saying regarding the mujahideen and the martyrs. If they had obeyed us, they would not have been killed. Say, then prevent death from yourselves if you should be truthful. That is, if you are so clever, you are so sharp that your plannings can deter or can save people from dying, then plan, plan saving yourselves from death. And never think of those who have been killed in the cause of Allah as death. Rather, they are alive with their Lord receiving provisions. The martyrs in the path of Allah, they are not dead. Allah says in Quran, That do not announce that all those who lay down their lives in the path of Allah for the cause, fighting for the sake of Allah in the path of jihad, do not call them that they have been killed. They are not dead, they are alive. And how are they alive? It has been reported in a tradition that Prophet said that the spirits of all the martyrs, they reside in the form of beautiful green birds who go about in the in the in the in all the uh, gardens of Jannah, and they fly during the day, they fly in the gardens of Jannah. And they get their provisions from the gardens of Jannah. And when the night falls, these birds, they reside in the beautiful lamps which are hanging by the throne of Allah. So the martyrs, they should not be considered as dead. They are alive as according to the words of the verses of Quran and by the traditions of Prophet And how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approves of and how excellent is martyrdom. Prophet Sallallahu said that the first drop of blood of the martyr, when it falls, all the sins are forgiven. So the blood of martyrdom is a source of what? Atonement of all the sins of the life of the person. And how much does the person suffer? As if just pricking by a needle and all the sins are forgiven. Allahumma arzukna shahadatan fi sabilik. Allahumma arzukna shahadatan fi sabilik.
And what are the martyrs they're rejoicing in? Rejoicing, rejoicing in what Allah has bestowed upon them of his bounty. And they receive good tidings about those to be martyred after them who have not yet joined them and that there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. They receive good tidings of favor from Allah and bounty and bounty and of the fact that Allah does not allow the reward of the believers to be lost. They believe those believers who responded to Allah and the messenger after injury had struck them for those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward. Those to whom hypocrites said, indeed, the people have gathered against you, so fear them, but it merely increased them in faith. And they said, what? Hasbunallah, ni'mal mawla wa ni'mal wakil. Sufficient for us is Allah, and he is the best disposer of affairs. Now, what Allah is mentioning here is that when, despite inflicting heavy losses to the Muslim army, what happened is that when the Quraysh army, despite the fact that they had uh, inflicted heavy losses to the Muslim army, the Meccan army left. Then they stopped after a few miles and Abu Sufyan uh, started reconsidering attacking again because they knew that actually they were victorious and the Muslims, they had defeated them. So what happened when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he reached Medina, and um, all the 70 Muslims being martyred and 70 people being injured, they, they just entered their homes. The, the army, the people, the soldiers, the Mujahideen, they had just entered their homes and they had not even rested or they had not even um, truly melt their, their families, their wives and their children. That Prophet Wasallam was given a revolution that Abu Sufyan was started, uh, was, uh, was reconsidering attacking Medina again. So there and then Prophet Sallallahu when he got the news that uh, Abu Sufyan had had intentions of uh, attacking again, then there and then Prophet Sallallahu recalled all the Mujahideen for, for fight and for battle again. What a remarkable obedience was exhibited by the companions. All of them, all of them injured, wounded, exhausted, not even having met their families after their return, all of the companions, they were like labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, all the companions returned and gathered for jihad. And it was this time that hypocrites, they were, they were trying to deter them and they were saying that even bigger armies have gathered and they're going to attack, make an even bigger attack with a bigger army. But those who believed and those who were obedient, they, they said, Hasbunallah. They were still obedient, they were still patient, and they were still reliant on Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning and is mentioning and encouraging and talking about them and their behaviors. So what happened with them is, so they returned with the favor from Allah and bounty and no harm having touched them. And they pursued the player of Allah and Allah is the possessor of great bounty. That is only shaitan who frightens you of his supporters. So fear them not, but fear me if you are indeed believers. And do not be grieved by those who hasten into disbelief. Indeed, they will never harm Allah at all. Allah intends that he should give them no share in hereafter and for them is a great punishment. Indeed, those who purchase disbelief in exchange of faith will never will they harm Allah at all and for them is a painful punishment. Let not those, let not those who disbelieve ever think that because we extended their time of enjoyment, it is better for them. We only extended it for them so that they may increase in sin and for them is a humiliating punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us all from this humiliating punishment of the day of judgment. Allah would not leave the believers. Allah would not leave the believers in that state you are in presently until he separates the evil from good. 
nor would Allah reveal to you the unseen, but instead Allah chooses of his messengers whom he wills. So believe in Allah and his messengers. And if you believe and fear him, then for you is a great reward. And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty ever think that this greed is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse number 118 is definitely strongly condemned greed and miserliness. Allah says, let them not think who are greedy that this is better for them. Rather, it is what this greed and this being stingy and this being miserly is what? It is worse for them. How worse it is, this will end up with what? Their next will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. And to Allah belongs the heritage of the heavens and the earth. And Allah, with what you do, is fully acquainted. Allah, all acquainted of all the greed, of all the miserliness and all the stingy behavior is here mentioning about their punishment and is condemning and refuting this behavior. Being miserly, being stingy is not the attitude of a, of a believer. Prophet Wasallam said that a believer cannot be a miser. A believer cannot be a miser. A believer will be spending, spending in the path of Allah, will be making charity in the path of Allah. So he cannot be miser. He cannot be a stingy person. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is clearly mentioning the punishment of a miser. Is saying that they, their necks will be, will be encircled by bands on the day of judgment. What bands these are have been explained by the words of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that on the day of judgment, all those who will not spend in the path of Allah, they will be made what? They will be, they will be encircling their necks in the form of a bald snake, in the form of a bald snake with two black spots on its eyes, and it will hold their mouths, and it will tear the corners of their mouths and will say, Ana maluka, ana kanzuka, that I am your wealth, that I am your hoarded wealth you used to hold, and you did not make charity in the path of Allah. And here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they will be, they will be punished. Similarly, Allah says in the words of Surah at tawbah that all those, Wallazina, verse number 34, 35 of Surah Allah says, Wallazina, Yaknizuna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say that all those who lay triers, who lay hold triers of gold and silver and do not spend them for the sake of Allah, give them the glad tidings of grievous sufferings. Give them the glad tidings of grievous sufferings. And what the grievous sufferings are, that on the day of judgment, the hoarded gold and silver, this will be heated in the hell fire and their foreheads and their sides and their backs will be branded with it. And then they will be what? They will be said, this is the trier you laid for yourself. Taste the evil of your hoarded triers. So this is how they will be punished on the day of judgment. All those who, who hoarded their wealth and did not pay, did not make charity or did not pay the zakat. In a detailed, in a detailed tradition, Prophet ﷺ has explained the punishment for all these people. Prophet ﷺ has said that on the day of judgment, all those people who will not have paid their zakat, what will happen is that they will be, they will be made to lie down with their faces on the ground on the day of judgment, and all this gold and silver. This will be brought in forms of slates and place, and it will be heated on top of the hell fire. And then 
their, their bags will be branded. And when these slates will get cold, then what will happen is that they will be, it will be heated again. And then they will be stamped again with all, and this will continue for 1,000 years till the accountability of people will take place and the people will, will take their places in hell or in Jannah. And then all those who had not paid the zakat for the camels, the, they will also be made to lie with their faces down on the ground on the day of judgment. And these camels will come. They will be much, much weighty than they are in this worldly life. And they will crush them with their feet and they will bite them. And these people, they will howl. And this will continue till the judgment will be made and the people will find their way towards Jannah or hellfire. And all those who had not paid the zakat for their goats, the goats will also come and they will trample them and they will crush them with their hoops and they will, they will tear them with their horns and they will shriek and they will howl and this will continue for 1,000 years till the accountability will be done and the people will take their, take their route towards the, uh, towards the hellfire or towards Jannah. So this will be the punishment of all those who have been misers in their life, who have been misers in their life. So what actually is miserliness? What actually is being stingy is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed a person, he has bounties of Allah, he has bounties of Allah, blessings of Allah, he has wealth, he has riches. He has all the wealth, he has all the riches. But despite the fact that he is wealthy and he is in a state of affluence, he has wealthy positions and riches. Despite the fact the person does not spend, the person does not spend on what is permissible, what is allowed, what is halal to spend on. And in fact, it is wanted that the person spends on that thing. Even then the person does not spend on those things. Then this is being miserly. This is being stingy despite being wealthy and affluent. It can be, the stinginess can be regarding the rights of the fellow beings or it can be regarding the rights of Allah. For example, for the rights of fellow beings, a man can afford but still does not spend on the for, for the family, like feeding, clothing, education, health, does not spend on that also. Although Hadith does teach us that words of uh, tradition are that Prophet said that there is a dirham which you spend for charity. There is a dirham which you spend for your slave. And there is a dirham which you spend for your family or for yourself. The best dirham is that which you spend for yourself and your family. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has taught all of us that when a husband feeds his wife or gives a gift to his wife, then this is what? This is like one of the best sadhakas he is making. This is one of the best charity he spends. And similarly, when a, when a person spends on his, on his family for their, for their worldly requirements and basic amenities and necessities of life, then this is what? This is like he is spending charity and he will be rewarded like charity. So if a person, if a person is blessed and he is wealthy and he is affluent, and despite of the fact he's not doing all this, it is a duty for the father to do all this or for a husband to do all this. He is being miserly. He is being stingy. And uh, as Allah says in Quran, that let the bounties of the sustainers speak. Let the people know that you are being blessed by the bounties. And there's an incident in the life of Prophet Sallallahu that he saw a person whose clothes were all filthy in her, and, and his hair, head, hair were all messed up, filthy clothes and messed up hair. And Prophet Sallallahu when he saw him, he, he, he inquired that is he non-affording? That is he poor? And the companions told him that no, he, was, he is a wealthy person, he is affluent. And then Prophet Sallallahu said that his condition his conditions should speak of his economic status. And that is exactly what Allah says. So it means that we need to spend on our due, due worldly necessities. And if a person is not doing that, the person is being stingy and the person is being miserly. But basically what the verse is commenting here is 
the person being miserly and not spending charity or not spending for the obligatory zakat, not spending despite the fact that he has the nisab but does not spend the obligatory zakat and does not spend in the path of Allah, this is the punishment mentioned for this person by the verses and by the traditions I have mentioned is the punishment for this person. And similarly, we also learn by a tradition that Prophet said that every morning, every morning and every evening, two angels supplicate in the heavens and they say that, oh Allah, oh Allah, destroy the wealth of all those who do not spend in the path of Allah and bless and bless and multiply the wealth of all those who spend in the path of Allah. And Prophet ﷺ has explained, swearing by Allah, explained to all who generally believe that spending in the path of Allah will lead to what? With our money and wealth being depleted. Prophet ﷺ said, biyadihi nafsi, By the word of Allah, by the name of whom holds my life, wealth does not decrease by spending in the path of Allah, and respect and status does not decrease by forgiving. Rather, Allah raises the rags of the person who, who forgives. Allah has certainly heard the statement of those Jews who said, indeed, Allah is poor while we are rich. This is a criticism, Na'uzubillah, with the Jews used to make when they were asked to spend charity in the path of Allah and feed the poor and clothe those who do not have clothes. So they used to say that Allah is poor while we are rich. We will record what they said and their killing of the prophets without right and will say, taste the punishment of the burning fire. That is for what your hands have put forth and because Allah is not ever unjust to his servants. They are those who say, indeed, Allah has taken our promise not to believe any messenger until he brings us an offering which fire from the heaven will consume. Say, there have come to you messengers before me with clear proofs and even that of which you speak. So why did you kill them if you should be truthful? So the people of the book to justify themselves why they were not believing in Quran and in the prophethood of Prophet Sallallahu they came out with this illogical excuse. And they said that if only Prophet Sallallahu would make a sacrifice which would be consumed by a fire from heaven. Because, you know, uh, in the time of Bani Israel, this was a manner. That when the people or when the prophets even, they made a sacrifice of an animal, then a fire used to come from the heaven and used to consume the sacrificed animal. And this was a proof that the sacrifice had been accepted by Allah. So the Jews and uh, uh, and the Christians they had uh, they 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 used to say that if Prophet Sallallahu showed them this form of a sacrifice which was taken up by the fire, then only will we be accepting his prophethood. So Allah says that there were prophets who were showing you this miracle. Then why did you fail to accept their prophethood in their lives? Then if they deny you, so were messengers denied before you who brought clear proofs and written ordinances and the enlightening scripture, every soul will taste death and you will only be given your full compensation on the day of resurrection. So he who is drawn away from fire and admitted to paradise has attained his desire. And what is the life of this world except the enjoyment of delusion? Allah save us all from these deluding enjoyments. Allahumma a'inni ala ghamaratil maut wa sakaratil maut. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabbi aini ala zikrika wa shukrika wa khusni ibadatik. Rabbi ibni li aindaka baitan fil jannah. Rabbi ibni li aindaka baitan fil jannah.
you surely will be tested in your positions and in your cells, and you will surely hear from those who were given the scripture before you and from those who associate others with Allah much abuse. But if you are patient and fear Allah, indeed, that is of the matter worthy of determination. And mention when Allah took a covenant from those who were given the scripture saying, you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it. But they threw it away behind their backs and exchanged it for a small price and wretched is that which they purchase. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as is previously explained, that all the mankind was created and presented before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where they made a pledge of the sustainer, Alastu bi rabbikum, and they replied, What qalu bala? After all this, the prophets, directly the prophets and indirectly all their followers, they were made to take a pledge that if any prophet, who succeeded their prophet, then they will believe the succeeding prophet. And not only will they believe in them, they will obey them and they will help them. So this has this verse has been sent as, uh, as, an, uh, as a reminder. This verse has been sent as a reminder for the Jews and the Christians regarding the pact or regarding the pledge they had made regarding Prophet and the Quran, which they were they were failing to uh, complete the pledge and they were not believing in Prophet and the Quran. And never think that those who rejoice in what they have perpetrated and liked to be praised for what they did not do, never think them to be in safety from the punishment and for them is a painful punishment. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth and Allah is over all things competent. Verse number 190, indeed in the criterion of heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for those of understanding. From here are starting the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Imran as proven by the Sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding the excellence of these last 10 verses, we learn that these were the verses which Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite when he used to come, when he used to wake up for the Salatul Tahajjud. It has been reported by Hazrat uh, Abdullah bin Abbas, Rasulullah Ta'ala and who in Bukhari, when he was reciting, uh, when he was residing in uh, the house or the apartment of his aunt, and he saw what Prophet ﷺ did when he got up for the Salat of the Hajjud. He narrates that uh, Prophet ﷺ, he, used, he got up and he uh, recited a few verses and then he did wudu and then he started offering the Salah of the Hajjud. What did he recite? We learn from these uh, traditions is that when he got up for the Salat of the Hajjud, he used to recite, first of all, he used to recite the supplication for waking up Alhamdulillah, ahyana ba'dama amatina wa ilayhi nashud. And then 10 times each would he recite Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Astaghfirullah, and then the recitation of uh, the glorifying uh, 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 verses of Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, and then la ilaha illallah, Wahtahu la sharika lahu, Wallahu al hukmu, Wallahu al hamdu, Wahua ala kulli shayin qadir. And then Prophet is also been mentioned, and he used to do himself also, that he mentioned that when somebody recites, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wa la ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, that he glorifies and exalts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he says, Allahumma gfir li, or Allahumma gfir lana, that is, he seeks forgiveness, then he is, all the sins are forgiven. And then after reciting all this, he used to recite these 10 verses of Surah Al-Imran also. So here in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the traits and the manners of whom Ulul Al-Bab, Ulul Al-Bab being the people of wisdom, the people of understanding and the knowledgeable bondsmen. <coughs> 
So who the ulul albab are and how do they behave and what do they go about doing in their daily lives is alladhina yathkuruna Allah qiyaman wa qa'udan wa ala junubihim. Ulul albab are those who remember Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides. So this part of the verse shows what? That it is the knowledgeable ones men of Allah who remember Allah. So it is showing what? The excellence of remembrance of Allah. Not only that, it also shows how and what is the manner of excellence of the remembrance of Allah for the bondsmen. The remembrance of Allah, zikr in all form can be done in all forms, sitting, standing, and lying. So how does a believer remember Allah, glorify Allah, exalt his Lord is, he does not have to quit the worldly activities and sit aside for a specific time, for a specific duration to exalt and glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in a few words of tasbihat. No, what we need to do is that as obedient servants of Allah, we remember to we need to remember Allah in our hearts. The heart has to be supple with the remembrance of Allah, and the tongue has to be supple with the with the remembrance of Allah, with the glorification for Allah. And we are working around cooking, baking, cooking, baking, dusting, sweeping, driving all parts of the body, serving the mankind, performing our duties, paying the rights of others and paying the rights of Allah, and paying the rights of the bondsmen. But concurrently, at the same time, the tongue is supple with the remembrance of Allah, and the heart is rich with the remembrance of Allah. This is the manner of remembrance by the obedient servants of Allah. And then, not do they only remember Allah. What do they do? They also ponder over the creations of the Creator. What do they do? They remember Allah while sitting or standing or lying on their sides, and they give thoughts. They give thoughts to the creation of the heavens and the earth. And when they ponder over the creations of the universe, what do they do? When they think over, they concentrate. So what do they do? They, this, is a, this is a remarkable combination of remembrance and thinking. And when they, when they do remembrance and thinking and comprehension in this combo, they comprehend the realities of their life. They understand the secrets of the universe and the purpose of the creation of the universe. So when they give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, they say, Oh Lord, oh Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishments of fire. So these are the knowledge. These are the ulul albab who remember Allah, who remember Allah in all conditions, everywhere, all times, and accompanied with remembrance, they look around and they see the creations of the creator, and then they comprehend, they understand the secrets of this universe and the purpose of creation of the universe, and they realize what? That this universe was not created purposeless. It was created with the purpose of what? with the purpose of trial. This is a period of trial. This is an examination hall for the believers. They realize, they realize that this world, this universe is a period of trial. And realizing this, they pray for the success of hereafter to be saved from the trials and torments of hell after. They say what? These knowledgeable, sensible, wise people of wisdom, they supplicate to Allah for what? They say, our Lord, indeed, whoever you admit to fire, you have disgraced them. And for the wrongdoers, there are no helpers. So they, they realize that whoever will be saved from the, from the punishments and from the torments of hellfire will be the successful. They supplicate our Lord. Indeed, we have heard a caller calling to faith, saying, believe in your Lord. And these sensible people do what? They say, we have believed our Lord. So forgive us our sins and remove from us our misdeeds and cause us to die within the righteous. So these are the learned, these are the knowledgeable, these are the wise men who behave how that when they, they learn that somebody is inviting them towards the faith, the sensible people do what? They respond to the call. They respond to the call by faith and belief. 
and what is the relationship of a sensible bondsman, of a knowledgeable, a wise bondsman to the past, to the present, and the future is exactly what I've already explained. That uh, ulul albab, they relate to their past, saying what? Forgive our sins, seeking forgiveness, repenting and seeking forgiveness. And for the, for the present is what is eradicating all sins, rectifying themselves, reforming themselves, leaving their sinful manners of their life. And for the future is fear of hereafter. Now, when they respond to Allah and return to Allah with these supplications, what does the Lord answer back? They say, our Lord, and grant us what you promise what you promised us through your messengers and do not disgrace us on the day of resurrection. Indeed, you do not fail in your promise. And their Lord responded to them, never will I allow to be lost the work of any worker among you, whether male or female. Remember, there's no gender discrimination in this world and in hereafter also. You are one of another. So those who emigrate or were evicted from their homes, or were harmed in my cause, or fought, or were killed, I will surely remove from them their misdeeds, and I will surely admit them to gardens beneath which rivers flow as reward from Allah, and Allah has with him the best reward. Be not deceived by the uninhibited movements of the disbelievers throughout the land. It is but a small enjoyment. Then their final refuge is hell. Wretched is the resting place. But those who fear their Lord will have their gardens beneath which rivers flow, abiding eternally therein as an accommodation from Allah, and that which is with Allah is best for the righteous. And indeed, among the people of scripture are those who believe in Allah and what was revealed to you and what was revealed to them, being humbly submissive to Allah. They do not exchange the verses of Allah for a small price. Those will have their rewards with their Lord. Indeed, Allah is swift in account. Allahumma hasibna hisab and yasida. Last verse, verse 200. O oh, you who have believed, persevere and endure and remain stationed and fear Allah that you may be successful. So, this is the last verse of Surah Al Imran where Allah has summarized, has summarized in nutshell the message of the whole of the chapter following the narration of events of Uhud, that what four key points you have been taught is, number one, that, oh, believers, the first thing what you need to do is espero, be patient, be patient while obeying the messages, commandments, and teachings and orders of Quran and Hadith. If any social, psychological, emotional, economic issue, calamity, crisis, or hardships befalls you, you stay perseverant, you stay steadfast, and you stay obedient to Allah in full state of patience. This is what Isbiru means. Number two, Swabiru. Swabiru means, number one, extreme and ultimate form. Extreme and ultimate form of patience or a superlative degree of perseverance and patience. Or the second meaning is a mutual advice of patience that you, you stick up to a superlative degree of patience and perseverance yourself and you advise each other mutually to be patient and perseverance in the path of Allah also. This is exactly what Allah has explained in another verse, Tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. This Allah has maintained, explained in Surah Asr as a source of Saving ourselves, tawasa bil haqqi wa tawasa bil sabr is what it is. A, this is a point and is a key point to save ourselves from the losses of here and hereafter, as explained in Surah Al Asr. And the third point, which Allah says, is warabitu. Rabitu, endure and remain stationed. Rabitu has two meanings. Number one is to stay connected, to stay connected, linked up 
and to stay united. That is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all the Muslims that at all levels you stay united with mutual love and a love and a feeling of mutual brotherhood and Islamic fraternity, you all stay united against and protect the teachings of Quran against uh, the enemies of Quran, you stay united. And the second meaning of Rabatu is to protect and to guide, to protect and guide the teachings of Quran and Hadith, to protect and to guard, to protect and guard the laws and limits of Quran, to protect and guard the boundaries of your Islamic states also. Prophet has been reported to inform all of us that he said that staying to guard, to staying to guard the boundaries of an Islamic state for, for a minute is better than what is here and hereafter. And then explaining regarding his own priorities also, Prophet said that I, I stand to guard the boundaries of my Islamic state for a moment, I would prefer it to stand in Salah in front of Hajri Aswad, the black stone throughout the night. So this is the importance for struggling and striving for the protection of the Islamic boundaries, of the boundaries of the Islamic state. But remember today, in the period of today, Guarding the boundaries of the Islamic State is not just what is important because the wars today, the wars in the modern period of today, they are not being conducted on the geographical boundaries alone. Yes, geographical boundaries are no doubt insecure and they do no doubt they need to be protected and they need to be guarded. The Islamic boundaries of the Islamic States, they do need to be protected and guarded. But wars today, not being just carried on on the geographical boundaries. What is being attacked today, the education, the educational, economic, cultural, health spheres are what are being attacked today by the anti-Islamic forces. So the educationalists, the educationalists, the economists, the writers, the doctors, the teachers, the professors, they need to guard the fields which are being attacked by the anti-Islamic powers. And they need to guard their respective fields to implement and to strengthen Islam. And then the last point which Allah suggested here is وَاتَّقُوا As Allah has mentioned in Quran, فَلَا تَخْشَوْهُمْ بَخْشَوْنِي لِأُتِمَّ نِعْمَتِي وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَحْتَدُونَ That do not fear your enemies. Do not fear the anti-Islam powers and forces Fear whom? Fear Allah, who controls, who controls the whole of the universe, who controls, in whose control is, are the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the oceans, the place under the earth, and the angels of the heaven. So these are the four points, the pivot points. Isbiru wa swabiru wa rabitu wa taqullaha la alla kuntuflihoon. The four points for success here and hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are, we cannot show our gratitude enough to help us all go through the message of Surah Al-Imran. Allah accept this all from all of us and help us remember. Help us remember all these messages we received from the verses of Surah Al-Imran. Help us believe in them. Help us, help us adopt all these messages of Quran and help us stay, stay in a state of obedience, in a state of reliance, with full perseverance, with full steadfastness, and in complete patience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us, help us move on sarat e mustaqim with full patience and perseverance. Rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah, Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Allahumma hasibna hisab bin yasira. ربنا لا تزع قلوبنا بعد إذ خديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوحاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يسبون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين 
آمین سمامین